Secretary Mattis recently approved dual status commanders in the states of South Carolina, North Carolina, and Virginia. General O'Shaughnessy has a robust team at FEMA headquarters and former forward deployed with each of the FEMA regions to coordinate operational and tactical support. He will now provide an update on the operational actions taken to prepare for Hurricane Florence. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, and thank you, members of the press corps, for your ongoing efforts to inform the public, a role that is especially important in light of the danger that hurricanes and other natural disasters pose. And FEMA Administrator Brock, Brock Long said that the emergency response and recovery is a whole community effort, and I could not agree more. So what I'm going to do is walk you through the DOD response and the efforts that we have ongoing from the local level, the state level, and then the federal level. At the local level, it's important to remember that members of the military are also members of the communities that are affected by this storm. North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, and Georgia are all home to well-known military bases and installations. And the Secretary of Defense has given authority for life-saving and life-sustaining actions in order to make DOD capabilities immediately available, and local commanders are proactively positioning forces and equipment to be ready. At the state level, National Guard units, whether Army or Air, under the authority of their governors are ready to respond to the individual and oftentimes neighboring states needs. We are closely linked and synced with them through FEMA and other emergency coordination networks to ensure that we understand the governor's priorities and requirements and how we, Department of Defense, can contribute to the overall effort. I've been in close co communication with each of the state adjutant generals who work directly for the governors and we are also tied to the emergency management ops centers within each state. We are able to anticipate the robust response from both Title 10, or active duty, and Title 32, the National Guard personnel. The Secretary of Defense has activated dual status commanders in North Carolina, South Carolina, and Virginia to provide seamless command and control over assigned active guard and, re and response forces. Finally, I'm in constant dialogue with the Chief of the National Guard Bureau, General Joe Engel, to ensure that our efforts are seamless. Along with FEMA, state governors, and the National Guard, DOD is responding robustly. National Guard commanders have the experience and understanding to lead our forces for this kind of mission, and they have my complete confidence and support. And while I can attest to the tremendous capability that resides within the local and state level, based on the magnitude of this storm, DOD's proactive actions are ensuring that our forces are optimally positioned for immediate response. And you may have heard me say formally that Homeland Defense is the number one priority for NORTHCOM and NORAD, but we and the rest of DOD are leaning forward to provide military capabilities in support of FEMA and our state and local partners while still defending the homeland. The same capabilities that make the U.S. Armed Forces so powerful in combat lend themselves extraordinarily well to disaster relief, and we are ready and able to support FEMA and state and local officials in situations where unique capabilities are required to assist our communities. I'd like to take this opportunity to give you a snapshot of how we are proactively positioning forces now to respond from the north, from the south, from the east, and from the west across the full spectrum of DOD capabilities at every level by air, by sea, and by land. DOD is providing FEMA the following military installations as staging areas for relief commodities. Fort A.P. Hill, Virginia, Joint Base Bragg, North Carolina, North Auxiliary Airfield, South Carolina, and Maxwell Air Force Base in Alabama. And then at Fort Stewart, Georgia, and moving forward from Fort Campbell, Kentucky, we have multiple composite truck companies of approximately 80 light, medium tactical vehicles, or LT LMTVs, each stage to respond quickly once Florence passes through the area. LMTVs are high water clearance vehicles which can carry supplies of, or first responders to high water areas not accessible by typical first responder vehicles in order to rescue trapped individuals or perform house-to-house -house checks. This capability was used to great effect during Hurricane Harvey operations last year. At Hunter Army Airfield, DOD has approximately 35 helicopters that are available to, for search and rescue operations. A similar unit is at Fort Bliss, Texas, ready to move forward. At Fort Bragg, North Carolina, in addition to acting as a staging area for release supplies, 40 high-wheeled vehicles for rescue and transportation, as well as seven helicopters, are staged within a hurricane reinforced hangar positioned for use in SAR and recovery missions. The USS Kearsage in Arlington, which will literally chase Florence in, has Navy and Marine personnel in addition to life-saving assets to include 16 helicopters and six MV-22s. 
At Moody Air Force Base, Georgia, we have the U.S. Air Force Search and Rescue Package with six HH-60s, two HC-30s, and four pararescue teams ready and able to assist in search and rescue as they are requested. We also have additional search and rescue teams at Moody that came from Patrick Air Force Base, Florida. At Tyndall Air Force Base in Florida, representative of the broader DOD support to Cur Hurricane Florence, First Air Force will provide robust command and control, air operations support, as well as assisting in vital search and rescue efforts to include airborne C2 assets, such as the Joint Stars E8 under NORTHCOM authority. We have quite literally surrounded the expected affected area with DOD capability that will be critical in hours and days following the storm's impact. I've shown you the robust capabilities and capacity that DOD has to support and respond immediately. If you look at the graphic, and we look quite literally from, from the sea, where we have the Kursage and Arlington that are gonna follow the storm in, all the way through to our Army and our great support that we have with the vehicles that are gonna be able to be used in a high water situation, to the helicopters uh, and all the way literally surrounding this affected area, the De Department of Defense is ready to respond when asked from FEMA, when asked from the governors, when asked from the local communities, uh, we are ready to respond and we are going to be ready for the first little minutes and hours uh, following Florence's impact. Thank you. Sir, thank you very much. Uh, Lita Baldur, Associated Press. Hi. Um, a couple questions. Um, General, specifically, um, you talked about the, the Kearsarge and the Arlington. About how soon do you estimate those two ships will be actually be able to get to the affected area, um, considering the slow pace of the storm? And I have, um, and I have another question. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. So quite literally, they're they are they are dependent on the storm's track. So they are literally following the storm in. So as the storm progresses, they progress in. So they are dependent on the weather conditions to clear to be able to come in. And that's why we, we're not singularly responsible looking at them for the responsibility to come from the sea, but we have surrounded it from the land as well, so we can take it before the storm gets there, the, the aircraft that we have and the vertical lift that we have coming from the south, from the, from the west, and from the north, we'll be able to access it, and then as the storm clears, we'll be able to get the Curacao and Arlington in. And then, so secondly, what do you see as the biggest challenge as you look at sort of the, the scope of the storm? And specifically, one of the issues that has come up in previous um, storms and other disasters is um, this DOD waiting for states to ask for something that the military knows they should be asking for and they're not asking for it yet or asking for quickly enough. How are you addressing what has been sort of a perpetual problem? Well, first I'll say uh, Secretary Mattis's guidance to me is clear. Uh, we are anticipating the needs. We are moving forward under our own authorities to be able to respond as soon as that request is made so that we don't longer have to generate a force once that request is made, but that force is immediately available. And as we look into this storm and working closely with Brock Long, as he looks at what he thinks his biggest challenges are gonna be, in the immediate aftermath of the storm's landing, we think the search and rescue, the vertical lift, and the ability to, to bring in those helicopters is going to be a key asset. And again, in close coordination with Administrator Brock Long. The search and rescue is going to be search. Excuse me. Search and rescue is going to be the biggest challenge. Is that particularly like along the water's edge, or is that? I think because of the, as we see the storm coming in, the even though it's degraded to a Cat Two, we see because of the length of time it's going to be on the coast and the heavy rainfall that will happen. We do think the flooding, the storm surge combination together, uh, will be a very difficult challenge to overcome. And so the search and rescue is probably the the, the first and foremost uh, response that we be looking at, but it's not the only response we're looking at, it's just that temporarily will be incredibly important to have that those assets available, not on a generation in 24 hours, but immediately available, and that's why under Secretary Mattis's authority, we were able to push those forward and have them ready for immediate response. Okay. Tara Cott, Military Times. Thank you. Um, between all the air, land, and sea assets you have in place, about how many personnel total are involved in this response? Yes, a good question. At, at this moment, it's a rapidly changing number, but at this moment we have approximately 7,000 personnel. Of that, uh, just over 4,000 is uh, National Guard and about 3,000 active duty. That number will, will change and fluctuate uh, drastically over the upcoming hours, uh, and we will be able to keep you informed as that number goes through our press releases. Okay, and then um, where does the money come from for this response? Is there a specific emergency response bucket that you're, you're pulling from, or where does it come from? Go ahead. 
So the Stafford Act uh, is the legislation that provides the Department of Homeland Security with dis disaster relief funds. So federal support uh, for federal missions supporting state and locals uh, in an emergency like this are paid via Stafford Act. Okay, and then uh, just the last one, you know, looking at this tremendous, like, kind of pre-positioned response, you can't help but think of Puerto Rico last year where it took days for ships to start together and realizing as, as Lita got to, the part of that was the the knowledge of having to ask for it. What sort of lessons have been learned as far as being able to respond and help uh, American citizens? So we did a detailed lesson learned process as we do uh, post any significant event in the Department of Defense. Uh, and what we got out of that assessment is uh, we have processes in place, for example, to develop a common operational picture that we share with all DOD entities and with our federal partners. Uh, we have a common asking picture, which is the requests that we are getting or believe that we will be getting from other partners. Uh, and then we have a common tasking picture. So we understand what assets from what entity within the department are being sent to support uh, the response to the storm. Uh, we've had that in place. We've made some significant improvements to that just based on those three storms that were overlapping literally, uh, creating a level of intensity and depletion of resources that really was unprecedented. General Chu. I would just say the close collaboration that we have uh, established between FEMA, between the governors, uh, is allowing us to populate those databases, to populate so we fully understand the requirements, the needs, uh, even before the formal processing has, has been uh, completed. Uh, I think the relationship we have right now uh, is as strong as it's ever been between the federal forces, uh, the, the local state forces, and of course FEMA, and under the administrator Brock Long. Louis Martinez, ABC. Hi, um, question about prepositioning. I believe during Hurricane Irma, which was, I think, in Florida, you had prepositioned a lot of assets outside the storm area, um, but then later on they weren't needed at all because the state assets could handle it. Um, as we look at this storm, do you foresee that the guard that will be able to handle uh, SAR in, immediately after the storm and may not even require your assets? Well, I'll say the, the all the local uh, National Guard is well postured to respond to the search and rescue requirement. The magnitude of this storm may exceed their capability, uh, and if it does, we want to make sure that we are postured and ready to respond at a moment's notice to that. Uh, so if we end up with this force that we have that uh, is not needed because either the storm does not have the impact that it, we think it might and or the local uh, responders and uh, the National Guard under the governor's authorities can handle it, uh, then that is just fine and we have met our mission. Also, uh, with Hurricane Maria in uh, Puerto Rico, uh, obviously there was, the, the electrical grid was impacted in a huge way. There have already been predictions that maybe three quarters of some of these states may lose uh, power for weeks. Uh, what kind of a role can you play in that? I mean, specifically the Army Corps of Engineers, I think they were the lead with Puerto Rico afterwards. What can you do uh, in, with helping them in this immediate effort? Yeah, so that, just as you mentioned, the Army Corps of Engineers is, uh, will be uh, very uh, deep in that regard, what we are trying to do is synchronize that effort. And so we work closely with the Corps of Engineers, with FEMA, with the local uh, authorities so that we can anticipate those. And the staging areas we have right now, for example, are full of the generators that you mentioned uh, so that we can be able to respond and push those forward. Uh, so it's a close, again, it's that collaboration, it's a close working, it's bringing all of the elements of the Department of Defense to bear uh, against uh, this challenging problem set. I would just note that one of the benefits that you get from uh, a disaster on the mainland where you've got multiple contiguous state is there's a tremendous amount uh, of proximity that states will provide in their emergency management assistance compacts. Uh, there, are, there are electrical uh, repair vehicles heading towards the southeast coast from all over the country as we speak. Uh, massing on the outskirts of where the, the hurricane will have the most impact, ready to go in. If that's not sufficient to meet the need, then the states will make a request at FEMA and DOD will be there uh, with, with assets uh, as requested by them to meet the need. Sylvie Lantome, AFP. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, do you have an idea of uh, how many people were evacuated from the coastal uh, area? I, I heard the figure uh, over a million today, but that was uh, probably as of earlier today. Uh, 
I, I don't, we don't have those statistics. I don't know if uh, General O'Shaughnessy. No, I'll probably direct you to FEMA for the direct answer. Tom Squitieri, Talk Media News. I don't have a question. Sorry, I was scratching my head. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Lu <laughs> Lucas Tomlinson, Fox News. General, what specifically are you doing differently this year compared to last year with the hurricanes? Right. I think, uh, as was mentioned, uh, we take the lessons learned from last year. Although it was a, uh, a phenomenal, re robust response, uh, we can always learn from that. And so I think the anticipation, uh, the coordination ahead of time, the collaboration of really understanding what are those requests going to be in a, in, in, a, in a manner that will allow us to predictive, uh, predictively Preposition our forces has set us up for success for for uh, for Florence. There's nothing specifically that you're doing differently this year. Then there's multiple things that we're doing differently with respect to how we're quantifying those requests and how we're able to respond to them in the sense of how we're processing it, uh, so that we can do so quicker. But it's it's not one thing that drives that. It's the multiple of things that we're doing in order to drive that time from request to actual response and action. I think is going to set us up for success for this event. Carla Babb, Voice of America. Uh, two questions instead of a question and a follow, if that's okay. Um, so first, we've learned about some of the ships that have been sorted out. Uh, what other equipment has been moved out of the area, planes and other things, uh, and about how much has that cost to move those uh, that equipment out for the military? And then my second question is, on um, the search and rescue timing. Uh, every time that there's a hurricane, especially in the Carolinas, there are people in the Outer Banks that do not like to leave because there is only one road and they, they feel like if they stay, then they, they don't have to worry about taking days to get back. Can you tell us how long you anticipate it will take to get to people if they become, uh, if they become, get into a dire situation? Yeah, first let me start by uh, all of the individuals and the citizens should listen to their local government and, and follow the appropriate uh, guidance that they've been giving with respect to evacuations. Uh, this particular storm I think is going to be challenging in regard to what you mentioned. Because of the slow moving nature of the storm, uh, it could very well stay with high winds, uh, inclement weather for a long period of time, which is going to mean that any rescue effort is, is going to take time. And so we still have the, the limitations that we have of operating within those weather environments are going to preclude us from necessarily coming in uh, in the hours uh, immediately after the storm hits. And so, again, I would really highlight the need based on the nature of this particular storm to really heed the evacuation uh, recommendations. With respect to. Days, sir, it, it, I think it's hard. It's weather dependent, so it's uh, unfortunately that part's un, out of our control. What, what I can tell you is, as soon as the weather allows us to, we will be able to respond very quickly. With respect to the movement of the force, uh, well, of course we have to move the force to preserve the force. So while there may be costs associated with that, is obviously prudent for us uh, in order to do so. I don't have an exact uh, cost of what that is, um, but uh, we can we can give you a follow-up answer on that. But obviously it's prudent for us to move it as opposed to have it damaged uh, by the storm. Tom po Tom Bowman, NPR. Now, the Marines apparently have decided to stay at Camp Lejeune, and they're going to be right in the middle of this storm surge. So are they part of the rescue effort? or they're going to have to find their own way out if things get really bad, number one. And number two, any sense of uh, getting the, the uh, hospital ship Comfort underway, or you just, and how long would that take if necessary? Yeah, so first, uh, we, we have trust and confidence in our installation commanders and the decisions that uh, they make re relative to evacuation or non-evacuation. Um, and so uh, we, we have uh, faith that that, those, that is, in fact, the right decision to make, and uh, we will stand by ready to support them. And the, on the positive side, because of their uh, proximity uh, and their great capability, that will also be part of the relief effort uh, that we can bring to bear uh, very quickly. So they will help in the effort. They will help in the effort uh, as well, and we're we're fully coordinated with them. We understand the capability and capacity that they have, uh, and we're we're working with them to find when they are going to be able to uh, be part of that response. I, I just add a note to that. All the DoD installation commanders have what we call immediate response authorities. Uh, so if there are life-threatening circumstances uh, in the vicinity, in the community uh, that they are in, uh, they have author pre-authorization to provide direct support to that. A number of these installations also have um, mutual aid agreements uh, with state and local authorities. So that just uh, makes more clear, and they've done some pre-planning about the types of capabilities that they would provide, again, in circumstances where there are threats to the community. I'll probably take this opportunity to... 
Uh, but first, I take the opportunity to highlight the uh, first responders and, and the amazing work that they, they have done and will continue to do in this effort. And of course, we want to marry up with them and, and be supportive of them. Uh, specific to your question on the comfort, we've been in close coordination with both FEMA uh, as well as the governors uh, and the, the local uh, state authorities. And at this point, we just don't think that that, um, that capability is, uh, is needed at this time based on the robust capability we have in the surrounding communities for our medical support. Hope, and if you would, identify your outlet for us, please. Hope Suck with military.com. Uh, Tom actually took my question, but I guess I'll follow up on it, which is, so you've got a situation in Onslow County where the, the instruction of the civilian uh, authorities and the military authorities is in direct contradiction, and there's a lot of angst coming out of that. I mean, um, in, in general, in, I mean, was that decision made by the base commander in collaboration or coordination? With, with NORTHCOM, um, and is there concern, you know, kind of about the mixed messages where, you know, the civilian authorities are saying to get out and the military is saying to stay? I would say first the decision was made at the installation level, uh, and we support uh, the decision of our local installation commanders. Jeff Schlogel, task and purpose. Uh, thank you. Um, General, can you say how many Marines are aboard the uh, Kearsarge and the Arlington? Yeah, I can get to the specific numbers uh, of, of the Marines that are on board, but essentially it's a, it's a, it's a light uh, special MAGTAF uh, equivalent uh, on board. So this is a robust capability and capacity, and it's going to be well suited, especially the MV-22s that have not only the vertical lift, but a lot of capacity uh, to bring on board. So uh, this, is, this is robust capability and capacity that will come to bear if required, and again, following right in the footsteps of the storm coming in. Are all the pararescue units, are they all uh, special operations? Uh, they're not all special operations. Uh, in fact, we have uh, all of the services uh, have contributed uh, to the pararescue and the rescue operators that are available for us. Thank you. Sure. Please state your name and outlet. Okay. Uh, Brian Everson of the Air Force Magazine. Uh, General, you mentioned the uh, pararescue standing by at Moody, but there are some teams coming in from, I think, New York, California, and Alaska at Dover. Are they being forward deployed to any other locations? Are they standing by? And can you give me a sense of what other forces you have standing by outside of the immediate area? Right, I sure can. And, and one of the things that I, I would uh, talk to is what we call our, our second echelon forces. And so what we're looking at is we have this immediate response capability that we know that we need, but we also want to balance that with not putting additional people at risk within the uh, affected area. And so we, uh, we've also put, besides those that we've talked about here, we've put people in what we call a PTDO, prepare to deploy order, normally at about a 24-hour string that we have them on to respond. And we have them all over the nation uh, ready to respond with the full capability and capacity uh, of the Department of Defense that will be able to, uh, to be applied here. This is a bit of a microcosm of that in the sense that this is forces that we have that we are bringing forward. In this case, these are guard forces that have been brought forward under the agreements uh, between the states uh, to bring that capability uh, forward that we know we have great rescue capability within those three units. So they're staying in Dover for now? They're staying in Dover for now, but they will be moved forward. Ryan Brown, CNN. General, uh, thank you for doing this. Uh, you talked a little bit about preserving the forest and the need to move certain assets out of the area. Do you have a kind of an overall number of how many assets and personnel have been relocated, given the high concentration of military facilities in the Carolinas and in that area? Do you have an overall number of how much has been relocated? Uh, we can we can get that number for you, but it will be a, a moving target in the sense that there's some that uh, moved out early, there's some that are continually moving out now, and then we'll also be bringing them back in a, in a stair-stepped uh, manner as well. But we can continually update on that, that movement of that number that will be, uh, uh, over time, continually changing. Courtney QB, NBC. Hey, uh, one quick one for you, General Shaughnessy. The prepare to deploy order, how many people are on that right now? Do you know how many? Thousands? Uh, it, it is it is thousands uh, of, of people and units uh, across the de entire Department of Defense. Uh, it is across all services, so the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Marines uh, are all uh, cont contributing to that force. Uh, that the the individual units have been sourced in the sense of they they know that they're on that PTDO uh, and they are prepared to to respond. Now, I know this is kind of a tough question, but uh, what do you think, I mean, so once the storm hits, what do you think is going to be the first military assets that start responding? You mentioned search and rescue, but are we talking about helicopters and things off of the ships because they're coming in behind it and so they will have, the weather will 
are we talking land, like vehicles driving up? I, I think it, it's going to be both the helicopters and the land vehicles coming from the south and the and the west uh, and the north uh, would be the first responders, depending on exactly how the storm tracks. But they'll be able to get in because of the weather uh, conditions, uh, get in sooner uh, than probably coming in from the sea. Uh, but that said, uh, we'll have to watch the changing weather conditions uh, to see which will be first. So like the guys from down at Fort Stewart and the high, right. the high vehicles, they'll probably be among the first Right, and, so, we'll and these are not static, so uh, the, the forces that we have, especially the, the, the vehicles that have the capability to operate within the high water, uh, we are actually uh, literally hour by hour looking to see where's the best position to, to push them forward. We want them absolutely as close as we can get without putting them at risk because we don't want to lose them before we actually uh, have an opportunity to use them. And one more thing, in your opening statement, you mentioned, or I'm sorry, forgive me, I, I'm not sure which one of the two of you said this, it mentioned these, that Secretary Maz had pre-approved... And we've been listening to officials from the D Department of Defense and from Homeland Security. They say they are prepared to immediately respond once they get the call from state and local authorities. There are several government agencies and resources, including the National Guard, that are standing by to assist FEMA in operational and tactical support. Our coverage of Hurricane Florence continues after a quick break. You're streaming CBSN, CBS News, always on.